Let's continue our introduction to vex and vops by looking at the lerp function. So as always, this project file will be available on Patreon, but let's take a look at how we can start to build out an effect like this one, where we have some things transitioning between two different objects. So let's do a box, let's drop that down, and we can start to build out what an effect like this may look like. So we'll just up the uniform scale a little bit here, maybe something like that. And let's drop down a match size as well, just so that this sits on the ground plane. We'll set that to min, and now we're on the ground plane. And let's drop down an RBD material fracture. And this is gonna be a little bit of a simulation, but we're not gonna really touch too much on that. If you wanna learn more about RBD simulations, I do have a whole series on that and a playlist that covers a bunch of different things uh, for how to do stuff with the bullet solver. But we'll cover what we need to real quick with this for this setup. So let's drop down a bullet solver. And then I'm gonna actually go back to frame one and we're gonna need an attribute adjust vector so we can set our initial velocities here. So it's already set up to velocity. I'm gonna enable this pre-process and overwrite the initial value just so that we can have an initial velocity. I'm gonna change this to direction only and set this to spread so we can have a little bit of like a cone angle. I'm also gonna set this to noise and we can get this kind of spread it out. I'm gonna enable this post process and check this minimum length. And this is gonna be our velocity. So uh, if I set this to something low, it's gonna have a low initial velocity and the higher you go, the higher the velocity that you will get. Let's go ahead and come back to our bullet solver and come to the collision and enable our ground plane. And then we can press play and take a look at what we're getting. And luckily this looks pretty good. We're basically going to be recreating a effect where the object just reassembles itself. So this should be good. We have 150, maybe we can go back a few frames. Yeah, we'll do like 130. So let's lerp between frame one and 130. So we'll do an attribute wrangle and we'll wire in our input there. Let's set this to a detail and then we can start to set up our lerp function. So because we're gonna be using this in a time shift node, I'm gonna to need to create an attribute. So we'll do i at, and we'll call this frame num, and we'll set this equal to lerp. And the lerp function takes three inputs. So the first input is gonna be your starting value, the second will be your ending value, and the third will be your bias, or basically how much you are blending between the two. So a value of zero for your bias would be the first value completely. A value of one will be the second value completely. And in between those, it's going to linear interpolate. That's why it's called lerp. It's gonna interpolate linearly between whatever values you set. So we have our value, let's, we said between frame one and 130. And then we can just create a channel float called bias or whatever you want to call it. I'm going to call it bias. And that is going to allow us, once we create this parameter, to just lerp between the first frame and the last frame. So you can see at zero, we are on frame one, and all the way at a value of one, we are at frame 130. So if I drop down a time shift node now, I can delete out this expression and you can write in our detail. And then actually I'm gonna rename this node, we'll call this frame num, just so it's easy to find. And we'll do parentheses dot dot slash in order to go up a level. And we'll call this frame num. So that is what our, what our node was called. And then we need to get the attribute that we wanna find. So again, frame num and we'll get the first value from that. So now as I go between the two of zero and one, you can see that we go from fully assembled to fully broken. So let's take a look at how we can do this in kind of a, like a procedural 
way or semi-procedural way. So maybe we have a character that we're going to be walking towards, have walking towards a bridge. And as the character approaches the object or the bridge, we want it to reassemble itself. So we can do that. Let's set up our, we will do a couple of points. So we'll do add, create a point here. And then, so this first point would be basically where our object is. So you'd place this, you could do an extract centroid or something like that to get where your object is at in space, but I'd start on the origin, so I'll just leave it on the origin. And then we'll call it, we'll just pretend that this second add node is our character, and I can even call it, you know, character or whatever. Let's wire this into an attribute wrangle. So we'll need to not dive inside. We'll wire up our simulation into the first input. We'll make this a detail. We'll set that add to the second input and our character to the third. And we're gonna use the distance function for this. So this is gonna be a good example of how we can take some of the things that we've already started to learn and build upon those to create more complex effects. So if you haven't looked at the video on the distance function, then definitely watch that if you need a refresher on how it works. But let's go ahead and create two vectors. So we're gonna do Vector P, we'll call this P1. So this is going to be our first point, and then or our first position, and then we'll use our point function to get our second input here. So a value of one, we'll call the position, and then we'll use the first point. So we're going to need a second one of these as well. We'll call this P2, and we'll change the second input to the third input by changing that to a two. And then we'll do f at dist to create a float called dist. And we'll generate the distance between p1 and oops, p1 and p2. Control and enter. And you see we now have a float here that is giving us a value of zero. That's because these are both on top of each other. If I press enter, you can move this around and that's going to give us a different value. So we are now calculating the distance between those two points or the distance between our character and our object that we want to have reassembled. So let's go ahead and apply this to our lerp. So let's create another attribute just so we can see what's going on, make sure that's actually working. So f at bias, you can just create a, a float uh, variable if you would like, but we'll do f at bias and we will call this or we'll use the fit function for this. So we'll use our distance as the input for that or dist. And then we want to remap this. So we'll do zero to maybe like 30. And we'll remap that from zero to one. And then we want to change out our channel float there and we'll just put at bias in in place of that so we're getting an error here uh, unexpected identifier that's because i forgot to put a semicolon there and now we have our our system all set up except for we have this little squiggly underneath our our equal sign there and if we take a look at this it says implicit cast from float to int use explicit cast instead. Shouldn't give you any issues, but let's just go ahead and fix that. We'll call the floor function. And what that's gonna do is basically just round down our value. So just adding that in there is going to get rid of that issue altogether. So now this slider does nothing, but as I move this around, it should, it should be calculating the distance between them and it is I was just too far away so as we get close to the object it's going to reassemble itself and then as we get further away it's going to disassemble now I don't want it to start when we're right on top of our object so let's go ahead and fix that I'm going to set this to be maybe like 10 units away and you know what 30 is probably fine so I'll do come back in here and as we start to approach our object it's going to reassemble and as we get further away it's going to disassemble itself so again just imagine like a character approaching a bridge or something that's all scattered about and then it's magically just reassembling itself as the character walks closer to it and then 
it can walk over and then as it gets further away it's going to just disassemble itself once again. So that's the basics of that. Let's take a look at how we can do this inside of Vops real quick. So let's drop down a detail Vop. We'll wire in our wrangle there. And let's go ahead and dive in. We actually don't need these two nodes, so we can just delete those if you'd like. Let's drop in a bind node, and we're going to bind in our dist attribute that we created. And we're going to wire this into a fit range once again. And we did, what, between 10 and 30 to 0 to 1. And this is going to act as our bias. So in VOPS, we don't have a VOP that's called LERP. It's actually called mix. And if I drop this down, you see we get the same thing. We get an input one or our first value, we have our second value, and then we have the bias between the two. So let's wire in our distance that's been that's been fit into the bias. And then we can leave these with constants, or you can do parameters if you want. Let's set this to an integer, and we'll make this a value of one, and then we want to go between frame one and 130. So we'll wire the first frame into input one, the second into input two, and then we want to bind export this back out. And we want to make sure it's an integer, and we can just call this frame num again. And you can see that we get a float here, which we don't want. So we do need to make that an integer. So we'll do a float to integer. Luckily, Vops just has a straight conversion Vop for that. Unfortunately, Vex just has the floor function. But let's go ahead and rename this to, we'll call this Vop frame num. And then we can make a copy of our time shift node. And let's change this from frame num, the frame num node to the Vop frame num node. And we can see that I can drag this around and we get the exact same thing that we had going on before. So that's a breakdown of how we can use this to create some different effects. There's one thing I'd want to cover as well real quick, and that's just how the LERP really works if you don't understand what linear interpolation is. Let's go ahead and take a look at this little visualizer that I've got going on here. So we'll go to the front viewport, I think. Yep. And I have just two lines here going from zero to 10. And there's a point on each, like each unit. So zero, one, two, three, four, all the way up to 10 on the X and Y axis here. So imagine this Y axis is our value. And then this X axis is our bias. So if I take a look at our LERP function here, I have these lerping between 0 and 10, and I've divided our lerp or our bias by 10 just to uh, keep it between 0 and 1. Since I'm you know, using larger values than 1, I don't want it to extrapolate past that. So this is basically just changing this bias back to a 0 to 1 value. That's what this is doing. So if I go back to zero, you can see that we are at zero, zero. And then as I go up between, so there, I've got 10, I can go up to a value of 10 in our bias. So I have 10 steps in here. So for the linear interpolation, a linear interpolation means that for each step that you take, it's going to move the same amount each step. So at frame or at a bias of zero, we're at zero, zero. So at a bias of one, we are now at one, one. So we're moving up one in our value since we're taking one step in our bias. And two, we'll be at two, two. And three, we'll be at three, three, and so on and so forth. So linear interpolation, if you don't know what it is, is, as I said, just a linear movement between the values. So for every step that you take, it's going to move the same amount every single time. So uh, you can visualize this as well in the animation editor, editor. So if I take a sphere here, let's turn off our points. And if I go back to frame one and I just animate the center here, I go to like, I don't know, it doesn't matter 
really frame 30. And I just move this up, make another keyframe. If I come to our animation editor, this by default is set to a Bezier curve. So you can see that we have this, whoops, we have this curve to it. So that is not what the linear interpolation would be. If I come to this function and I set this to linear, now you see that this is switched from this, this curve here to a nice straight line between the two. So for every movement that you take, it's gonna move the same amount for however much you moved. So if that's how the lerp function works, it's going to move the same amount no matter what. So that is a quick rundown of the lerp function, how to do that inside of vex and vops. It's super useful. Like I said, I've done uh, some things with it to create basically this is the same, same sort of an effect um, to generate a procedural animation. Uh, I'll leave a link to, or a card to it uh, right now, but I've created an animation where I did an RBD simulation and I used that simulation of the, the ball moving towards a door to actually just automatically open and close that door. So that's available on my on my Patreon as well as, as YouTube. You can check it out on there as well. Uh, it's free to, to take a look at that. So you can see how you can use this in practice. Like I said, uh, we're imagining that we have a character where the, the bridge is reassembling itself. It's essentially the same thing uh, that's going on in that video. We have a ball moving down towards the door where it opens as it gets close and closes once it goes on through. But anyways, hopefully this has helped you out and we've seen how we can start to build on top of some of the things that we have learned. So that's pretty cool as well. But anyways, thank you guys for watching and have a good day.